everyone. First off, we at The Familiar Strange want to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we are recording this podcast and pay our respect to the elders of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, past, present and emerging. Let's go. Hello and welcome to The Familiar Strange. I am Julia Brown, your familiar stranger for today. Welcome to the podcast, brought to you with support from the Australian Anthropological Society, the Schools of Culture, History and Language and Archaeology and Anthropology at the ANU, Australian Centre for Public Awareness of Science, and produced in collaboration with the American Anthropological Association. Today we have something different for you. Our friends from the Society for Cultural Anthropology and their podcast, Anthropod, have agreed to do a swap with us in the name of building a more global anthro community. They're going to play an episode of ours in June, and we're bringing you an episode of theirs right now. Cultural anthropology should need no introduction. They're a flagship journal, they're big on social media, their big virtual conference on displacements is wrapping up at the moment, and their website, cultanth.org, hosts some of the best really scholarly anthropological writing and debate on the internet. Their podcast, Anthropod, brings out interviews with academics and bite-sized explanations of key concepts like sovereignty and feminist anthropology. They also have a call out for guest producers, so if you'd like to be on Anthropod, have a listen to their show and send them an email at anthropod at cultanth.org. This episode is called Podcasts and Pedagogy, Audio in the Anthropology Classroom. It has its own introduction attached, so I'll sign off for now, but not before urging you to subscribe to Anthropod and subscribe to The Familiar Strange wherever you get your podcasts. You can find the Society for Cultural Anthropology on Twitter at colanth, that's at C-U-L-A-N-T-H, and we're on TFS Tweets. We're also both on Facebook. We'll be back in two weeks' time with another panel, and two weeks after that with a new interview with World Bank lead economist Vijayandra Rao, talking anthropology and development. Okay, here it is. This is Anthropod with Podcasts and Pedagogy, audio in the anthropology classroom. Welcome to Anthropod, the podcast for the Society for Cultural Anthropology. I'm your host, Anar Parikh, and on this episode, I talk to Professor Angela Jenks, a medical anthropologist and assistant teaching professor at the University of California, Irvine, about podcasts and anthropology pedagogy. As an anthropologist and podcast enthusiast, I see natural affinities between my discipline and podcasting as a medium and genre. The current age of digital audio has produced a fertile landscape for narrative-based journalism that interweaves individual human stories with considerations of how those stories speak to broader social, cultural, political, economic, and scientific processes. At its best, this is what ethnographic writing also strives for as it translates the anthropologist's experiences in the field in order to draw conceptual conclusions and make theoretical claims. Given the opportunity to design and teach my own Introduction to Cultural Anthropology course last summer, I tried including podcasts and audio media into my syllabus. And as with any pedagogical experiment, this experience left me with countless thoughts about what worked, did not work, and what I might like to do differently next time. Like me, Professor Jenks is relatively new to incorporating podcasts and other audio-based assignments into her teaching. But her preliminary forays into this realm, paired with her diligent commitment to pedagogy, offer valuable insights into how we can integrate podcasts and audio media into the anthropology classroom. In addition to her teaching and research interests in medical anthropology, science and technology studies, race, ethnicity, and the politics of difference, Professor Jenks has written extensively about anthropology pedagogy and served as the Scholar-in-Residence for the Teaching Tools section of the Cultural Anthropology website in 2016. So, first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview for Anthropod. I'm 
Really excited to talk to you today about podcasting and anthropology pedagogy. Oh, well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really happy to, to be here. I guess as a way to get started, I think the way that you talk about your interest in anthropology, you really talk about being interested in anthropology pedagogy. And so I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit more about your approach to teaching anthropology and your teaching philosophy. You know, I think my approach most often starts with trying to understand who exactly my students are, and then I end up adjusting my my specific approach accordingly. And, you know, sometimes this is difficult. We all have really diverse classes, so there's never a single student audience. Right now at UC Irvine, where I teach, most of the undergraduate students I teach don't really intend to become practicing anthropologists. And so that ends up guiding a lot of my approach. I teach a lot of very large classes, and some of them have up to, up to about 400 students in a class. And a couple of those students might be anthropology majors, but most of them are taking this class to fulfill some other requirement on campus. A lot of students come in, they're in their first anthropology class, they're in the only anthropology class they'll ever take. They're not especially familiar with the field, and so that ends up guiding a lot of my approach. I'm a medical anthropologist too, so a lot of the students who show up in the medical anthropology courses intend to either go into clinical practice, they're pre-med, they're pre-nursing, some of them plan to go into public health, and so a lot of my focus is on trying to help them connect these big anthropological questions, the big lessons the field has to offer to the actual world around them, to their everyday lives, to their plans for the future. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think many of us who teach anthropology classes have students who don't intend to become practicing anthropologists or even anthropology majors, but are fulfilling requirements or just looking to take anthropology classes as a different way to see the world. And so what does that look like on your syllabi in terms of what you assign students as far as reading or what they should be doing in terms of preparing for class or the assignments over the course of the semester? So the things that I ask students to produce tend to really focus on asking them to connect whatever we're talking about in class to their personal experiences. And so sometimes, especially when I've taught intro to cultural anthropology, I'll have them do a lot of short reflective essays. So if we're talking about food at one point, you know, to, to trace their own diet for a day and then write about the social and economic factors that are really affecting the foods that they eat or have them write about personal experiences with gender norms and roles. One class, for example, was an urban anthropology class, and I've had students ride a city bus through multiple neighborhoods and then write about what they see in different patterns of land use, what the environment looks like outside, what the experience of being on the bus is like. In some of my med anthro classes, I have them interview somebody about an illness experience and write an illness narrative or have them go to presentations at the local medical school so they can learn more about the culture of biomedicine. I sometimes have them write op-ed essays or that type of writing assignment that's a little different than the traditional research assignment. So asking them to actually take something you've learned in the class and make an argument about it to somebody else out in the world. Great. Thank you. So how do you think podcasts fit into this pedagogy or into this sort of focus on really trying to get students to think about anthropology by connecting to their personal experiences or to the sort of everyday ways in which we move through cities or the culture of biomedicine, for example. So I'm also, like you had mentioned, pretty new to starting to incorporate podcasts in my classes. In addition to some of those different assignments, I've also always tried to use a variety of different types of readings in classes. So students will read scholarly articles and ethnographies, but then also op-ed pieces or newspaper stories or personal narratives, or I've used novels. So I've always tried to incorporate this kind of variety of different reading materials. And I've used a lot of visual material during class sessions, but I've really just started to explore the use of audio material as a good option too. This last year I've assigned The Power of Categories from the Invisibility podcast as a way to start out my race, gender, and science course that I teach. And I use it as a supplement to the assigned reading to kind of start the class with a story. You know, and I think one of the great things that podcasts do so well is presenting stories and narratives of people's lives. So using that as a way to capture student interest in why these issues that we're going to talk about might actually matter to people's everyday lives. And then we get into some more of the theoretical approaches, some of the anthropological analyses of those stories. 
Absolutely. One of the podcasts that I was excited to assign was an episode from the podcast Another Round by Heben Nagatu and Tracy Clayton of BuzzFeed. And they did an episode called I Got Indian in My Family. And one of the hosts, Tracy, took a DNA ancestry test and then wanted to explore the narrative or myth of Indian blood that runs through many Black Americans' understanding of where they come from. And in the process of exploring these questions, they interviewed a number of scholars who do work on the cultural aspect of DNA testing, the roots of these narratives and relationships between Blacks and Native Americans historically in the United States. And I thought that it was really a compelling way to get at these questions of race and identity. Yeah, absolutely. I have actually just written that down. That sounds fantastic. In the race gender science class I teach, we do a section on DNA ancestry testing and the students read Alondra Nelson and Kim Tallbear. And that sounds like a perfect supplement to help work through some of that scholarship. What do you think are some of the possibilities and challenges of incorporating podcasts and audio media into anthropology syllabi? So for example, in my class, I assign podcasts as a supplement to reading, but my students found engaged listening to actually at times be more difficult than engaged reading and skipped over the assigned podcast or listened to them absentmindedly. So it occurs to me that we might have to teach students how to listen or engage with the material in a different way. Yeah, I think that's a really important issue. And I think there are parallels too to how we try to help students learn how to read or how to engage with visual or digital media. I know it's definitely something I've encountered with video clips in the past. Or if I show part of a video, you know, students will be really focused on what I'm saying. But then as soon as I press play on the video, they all put down their pens and they sit back with a little sigh of relief that, oh, good, now it's time to take a break. And there's a lot of strategies I've kind of worked to develop to have them actually engage with that kind of media. And I think some of those might be helpful as well with podcasts. So something like having students answer guided reflection questions, either in writing or in small discussion groups, or perhaps by producing their own audio media file in which they actually are directly engaging with the big issues that you want them to get out of that podcast. I think one of the other big challenges too, not always so much in assigning podcast production as assignments in class, I think the technical concerns are one of the big challenges there. And I know that's been an issue that I've been kind of struggling with. I've experimented a little bit with having students make their own podcasts instead of doing something like a writing assignment or a research paper. But I, you know, I am not an audio producer and I'm not a filmmaker or a graphic designer. And so a lot of these alternative types of assignments, I don't always know if I'm really qualified to guide students through the process. And I think a lot of faculty and instructors are just much more comfortable helping students with the writing process because it's the primary thing we do and we know how to do that really well. And trying to experiment with some of these other approaches, oftentimes there's some hesitancy with, you know, do I know enough about how to do this to really help students do it? To some extent, I've tried to work to get over that a little bit with my own hesitancy. And it can be okay to experiment with students or to learn from them. Oftentimes they have a much better grasp of some of the the technical requirements and, and processes than I do. So I learn a lot from them and we sometimes just muddle through and learn things together. Absolutely. The technical aspect of creating audio content is really interesting. In my last semester of coursework, I took a seminar on the history of radio in the Public Humanities and American Studies Department at Brown. And the final project was to create a podcast at the end of the semester. And that's where I got the inspiration to try to incorporate this into my own syllabi. But one of the things that I realized in the course of producing my own podcast is that with writing, we're asking students mostly to focus on the content that in asking students to produce podcasts, there's also the added time and investment of creating a polished piece of audio material, which requires additional technical work that's not just the research that we're used to doing when we ask students to write papers. Yeah, I think that's very true. Sometimes it, I think it depends on the kind of paper because I've had students write you know, an op-ed essay and then it, there is a lot of kind of teaching the convention of this. And oftentimes that's true 
in research papers as well. Although I think more often students come in kind of familiar with some of the conventions. It depends on who your students are. But it can be something that the conventions around how to produce audio projects or other types of media might not be as explicitly clear to them. It might not be something they've ever encountered or talked about in the past, really, in the way that that they've encountered written material. And so that has to be a lot of what we teach as well. Yeah. And so we've talked about this a little bit already, but what the opportunities are for incorporating podcasts into anthropology teaching, what do they offer that maybe anthropology teaching that hasn't taken into account so far? So I think one of the big things that they offer, and this is something that I think Well, I'm trying to think if this is something new to anthropology teaching. I think the two big things that they offer are really this focus on narrative and storytelling. And that is something that shows up in a lot of anthropology. I mean, good ethnography is telling a good story or telling multiple good stories. But it offers a kind of different way to get at it. The other big thing it really offers is a different kind of approach to public engagement. I've assigned students to create podcasts of their own in one of my graduate classes. And, you know, the goals of a graduate class are really different than the goals of an undergraduate class. In this case, the students are pursuing careers in anthropology. But I wanted them to really think about how they could communicate their own research or certain areas of scholarship to a number of different audiences. And so in a class I taught last year, that's our major pro-seminar foundational class in medicine, science, and technology studies, I ended up giving students a choice of three options for their final project. They could do a traditional analytic literature review that might be part of a research proposal or an orals preparation document. But I also gave the options of doing a course proposal and syllabus. So thinking about developing pedagogical skills and how you would take a body of scholarship and design an undergraduate course around that. And then the third option I gave them was to produce their own podcast about a particular issue that they are researching or a particular area of research related to medicine or to science and technology studies. And only a couple students took up the podcast challenge, but they really produced very interesting work. And I think there's pedagogical possibilities too for helping graduate students also learn how to think about what public scholarship is, what public engagement is, and how do we interpret what it is that we're working on for a much broader audience. I'm really glad that you brought up pedagogy for graduate students as well. I think that at times within anthropology and maybe I think probably across disciplines, such a focus on undergraduate teaching that graduate learning is mostly an informal apprenticeship based on unwieldy discussion seminars. And as a graduate student, I appreciate thinking really constructively also about how to develop particular skills and ways of thinking. And that actually leads into the next question that I had, which was about ways in which you've incorporated audio into your syllabi. So you were talking about that students had the option to record a podcast in a graduate seminar, but how this might have worked when you were teaching undergraduates as well. If you've assigned for students to make podcasts or to do audio reflections or audio blogs and what that looked like. So I am doing that for the first time this quarter, especially because I'm hesitant about my own technical capabilities. I often tend to experiment with new assignments or approaches in some of the smaller classes or in graduate classes and then work out any issues before, you know, I roll it out to 400 students in a really large undergraduate class. So I did that last year. I had graduate classes produce their podcasts. And then this year I'm co-teaching a new and somewhat experimental course here at UCI that's on engagement with scientific literature. It's an undergraduate class that I'm teaching with a chemistry professor. So we're looking at medical research case studies from both natural science and social science perspectives at the same time. So we're already focused on trying to have students engage with a number of different points of view around the same kinds of topics. And one of the final projects in the class is to have students conduct their own analyses of some body of scientific research or literature. And so we're focused on trying to allow this to take multiple different forms. So some students might choose to do written projects, but also others might choose to do video projects or audio projects, something like a podcast is the main suggestion that we're giving them. So I'm not entirely sure what the the final lessons learned from this will be, but it's something that I'm currently trying to experiment with. A couple of professors in my department have experimented 
with asking students to do audio blogs throughout the course of the semester in lieu of reflection papers. And that's been one way that I've seen some of my peers and professors incorporate audio blogs. But I tried out asking students to submit a five to seven minute audio reflection about a single course topic, theme, or question that they found compelling. And that was partly because of a limited time frame for the sort of technical aspect of producing audio. But I definitely found that students were self-conscious and reluctant to record themselves at first, but that they were also a little bit more extemporaneous in a way that allowed me to really gauge what students found most interesting about the course and, and what they got out of it in a way that was more personal about how they really understood the connections they were making between various kinds of course topics. That's really interesting. For example, we talked about space and then linguistic anthropology. So one student, she lived in public housing in New York, and her culminating reflection was on how language and space relate to each other and how people think about public housing and the words that they use to describe that public housing, which is a very poignant example of how anthropology really plays out on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds fantastic. I wonder how it would work, too, to have students do it rather than individually to have them like pair up and have a conversation around some issue that really resonated with them from the class. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's something that's uniquely dialogic about audio media in the way that it can foster conversations between people and getting over the initial self-consciousness, I think, about having your voice recorded or even in being filmed, that there's an opportunity to engage students with one another and also with the ideas. So on that note, one final question that I had is from the other direction or as someone who listens to podcasts and is also starting to incorporate podcasts into your syllabi, if you have any thoughts for those of us who are making anthropology podcasts, how might we think about making podcasts that are useful as teaching tools? I think the biggest issue is really considering audience. You know, who is this podcast designed for? And sometimes you can have multiple audiences. I think a lot of podcasts are designed to communicate among anthropologists. And that can be really useful to introduce people to somebody else's work and to the kind of work that they're doing. Or sometimes they're designed to communicate across academic disciplines to show why anthropology, you know, is really relevant to science and technology studies or to an issue that's happening in another discipline. Absolutely. But I think when there's a focus on pedagogy, I think very often a lot of that focus has to be on considering an audience that may only have a very vague understanding of what exactly anthropology is, what we do, what major debate or issues in the field have been. And so oftentimes trying to sort through those topics and kind of explain them in ways that may be very different if you're talking to an audience of anthropologists. And then I think, as I had mentioned before, you know, just this on storytelling, I think that is part of the power of podcasts and it's part of the power of ethnography in general to really be able to tell the stories of people's lives, to have people tell their own stories. And I think it's those stories that really capture students' interests and attention and make them start to think about, you know, why anthropology really matters. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is where there's an interesting possibility for the middle road between podcasts that are storytelling based and then the anthropology podcasts that really explore certain theoretical or conceptual issues and thinking about ways that we can bring them together to sort of make them more engaging or thinking about turning our ethnographies into podcasts um, is really exciting. Yeah, it definitely is. And I think that is one of the things that would be most helpful, certainly in classes that I'm teaching, that when I've used non-anthropology podcasts. Very often, they're fantastic for capturing students' interest, but then we spend a long time incorporating anthropological ideas in class. And it would be really interesting to see how we can do both of those things at once. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share some of your thoughts about pedagogy and podcasting together. Before we sign off, I was hoping that maybe you could give us some suggestions as to podcasts that you've used or ones that you like using in your classes. And Life, of course, has a huge history of a variety of different topics that they've explored. And very often clips from there can be very helpful. StoryCorps is also one that encourages people to tell personal narratives of their experiences that can be a great way to kind of kick off and start a conversation in a class. The Invisibilia podcast is one that I mentioned before that I've used. 
Recently, I just incorporated one from Anthropologist on the Street that's explicitly focused on having anthropologists discuss their research for a public audience, for a non-anthropological audience. And so that can be a great way to really introduce students to particular anthropologists and what they are really doing out in the world. I would say as an instructor too, this is less one that I use in class, but one that I found most helpful in thinking about pedagogy is the teaching in higher ed podcast, where there's very often discussions about issues around higher ed pedagogy that I found really helpful as well. If you have any final thoughts, otherwise, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me and for sharing the way that you've used podcasts too, and as you go forward with that, how it's working out in some of your classes. You've been listening to Anthropod, the podcast for the Society for Cultural Anthropology. Special thanks to Professor Angela Jenks for taking the time to speak with me for this interview. Beth Derdarian, the executive producer for this episode, and Camille Frazier for her editorial assistance on the teaching tools component of this project. This episode of Anthropod was produced in collaboration with the American Anthropological Association. You can subscribe to Anthropod via iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, and you can also find us at cullanth.org. That's C-U-L-A-N-T-H dot O-R-G. There on the website, you will also find a Teaching Tools blog post to accompany this episode, all of our previous episodes, as well as the journal Cultural Anthropology. You can also find the Society for Cultural Anthropology on Facebook and Twitter at Cullanth. I'm Anar Parikh. Thanks for listening. That was it. Anthropod's Anna Parikh and Angela Jenks. Subscribe to Anthropod and the Familiar Strange podcast. You can find us on iTunes and all the other familiar places. And don't forget to leave us a rating or review with your likes and dislikes. You can find the show notes plus our blog about anthropology's role in the world at thefamiliarstrange.com. If you want to contribute to the blog or have anything to say to me or the other hosts of this program, email us at submissions at thefamiliarstrange.com, tweet us at TFS Tweets, or look us up on Facebook and Instagram. Music by Pete Dabro. There's a link to his EP in the show notes. Special thanks to Anna Parikh and the whole team at Anthropod, Julia Miller, Will Grant, and Maud Rowe. Thanks so much for listening, and see you in two weeks. Until next time, keep talking strange. <laughs>